work sometimes, but that's okay. Um, a few house rules before I go forward. Don't keep Ernard in your mind, I can see that on your face. Smiling big. A <laughs> um, few house rules. Uh, before that, I hope everybody's had their sandwiches and drinks, which I noticed anyway. As a formality, I'm saying it, by the way. Um, please keep your phone on silent mode. You're quite welcome to switch it off too, if you want. Um, toilets are downstairs. Exit is, you guys have come from the entry, the same as the exit. So be aware of that. You know where to run when it's an emergency, personal or otherwise. Um, make sure you put your visiting cards or name in the card box, because there is a lucky draw at the end. One lucky winner will take the $38 million. <coughs> <laughs> no, no? <laughs> uh, hope so. Hope you got all your tickets, by the way. Um, okay, so coming to the serious part, because otherwise Bobby will say you're just cracking too many jokes and wasting time. Um, are you aware that there are now 400,000 properties that are now able to have more than one dwelling on site? Do you know that your property could be one of these? Under the AUP, which is Auckland University, of Auckland University, Auckland Unis Unitary Plan. See, these are all things which we use in WhatsApp and all these emojis and AUPs and all that abbreviations. So anyway, that's why I got confused. You have a potential to earn more money in either rental income or resale value. We all know in Auckland, it's in the middle of the housing crisis, with the city needing an estimated 400,000 houses over the next 30 years. The Auckland Council and government introduced the Auckland Unitary Plan. They aim to open a plan for new housing by allowing higher density in certain zones or rezoning, rural area for building and increasing house affordability. 400,000 people in Auckland now own land that could be converted into multiple dwellings. By opening land in this way means the housing crisis can be solved. You may be one of them. This is your opportunity. However, the process... Oh wow, my house voice sounds really good now. Should I repeat all over or you guys? <laughs> However, the process and compliance have become very complex and with the number of grey areas. The number of consultants required for a project consists of planners, soil engineers, designers, builders, fire engineers, drainage engineers, structural engineers, the list keeps growing longer. In this context, a robust experience team is what you need to pull it off. Let me introduce Bobby from Taza and Design, who has a very extensive team of consultants to make it easy for you. Bobby has been designing houses and developments since the past 17 years. He has masters in architecture from Unitech and is a professional member of ADNZ. His first multi-unit pro multi -unit projects is almost completed on site and he has been working on 15 multi-dwelling projects in the last couple of years. May I call upon him to come and share his wisdom and his knowledge? Bobby. Thank you. I'm sure you can hear me loud. Anand was just mentioning about the housing crisis. I've been hearing about this word since the time I arrived in New Zealand, 17 years back, and it's still a crisis. Uh, well, rather than focusing on the crisis, let's look at what we can do to make that into an opportunity for Auckland as in, in general, so that we can be actually doing something to solve the housing crisis, unlike some other government counterparts, and at the same time, do something for our own selves. So before we go ahead, can I just have a raise of hand? How many of you here have two or more properties? I'm sure people have properties over here. Two or more properties. How many of you don't have any properties, investment properties, I mean? Okay. So pretty much, pretty much majority are investment property people. Just checking that this room has the right kind of audience, because that's exactly what we're going to focus on. So you've heard about me, uh, I'm an architectural designer, I've been dealing with properties for a long time, except that I don't buy and sell, I actually design them and ensure that they increase in value 
and offer the owners uh, the best possible outcome. So all the your property owners that are out there, does, that, that's what looks good, good, right? You invest on one property, make money, invest on another one, make more money, and then this is how you keep going up, isn't it? Good picture? Is that, is that how it is? You buy property, make more money, and do more, 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 more? No, no problems? All seamless? Yeah? Everybody's quiet. Stressful. Stressful. <laughs> so, it's not always that way. Sometimes it is. You know, we don't want to be pessimistic and negative, excuse me. But sometimes along the road, the road is not bad, but sometimes along the road, if you are not well equipped, you can get these portholes. And then that can easily get transformed into something like that. So we know from our experience that this is what you are aiming towards, but this is what a lot of times you land up with. So our job is just to transit you from there to there. And that's what the seminar is all about. Good picture. It's easy to jump. It's easy to cross across. But if you again don't have the information and you don't have the right equipment, this is a problem. Sorry. Most of the times we see that success is actually, you know, I start the project and in three months I get building consent and I can sell my property. How many of you started like that thinking? Three months I'm going to sell my property. We have a lot of people coming and say, uh, it's September, October, can I get my building consent before Christmas? And we don't know where to look. You know, what's he talking about? So he, people realize a bit later that basically success is not you start and you get your goal. You do, but the, the road is a bit curvy. And our job is, we cannot guarantee you this, much as I would love to, but we can guarantee you a slightly better path than that. So why this whole thing is coming about, starting again from housing crisis? There is a housing crisis, there is a requirement for property, there is a requirement for renters. And as a result of all of that, is the opportunity. So just a little bit of a trivia from uh, just looking at how the property sales went. We did have that spike, as we all are aware, in the big boom times. And since then, property prices have, I want to say, fallen. The real estate agency would really love me. The property prices haven't really fallen, they have corrected. And if you see, they have kind of plateaued at, at the moment. So it's not all that bad. And I was asking a real estate agent, how's the market? And you know how some of them say, it's great. I said, how can you say it's great? People are, you know, said, yeah, it's great. You know why? It's great for the buyers, not for the sellers. So you have this cycle, as you're all aware. So we have this seller's market, so if people want to sell when it's boom time, and then you've got the buyer's market, which is so-called recession or, or, or a lower ebb in the marketplace. So this is just to give you a bit of a background in terms of the statistics and what's happening in the market. And why we are even talking about this is the unitary plan that's coming to effect. All of you are aware about the unitary plan, I'm presuming. You only have properties and stuff. So the unitary plan was introduced about, now it'll be three years, almost three years back. And as a result of that, almost all of Auckland was divided into these zones. And some people are getting very jittery about the fact that, hey, do we have uh, a slum over here? vertical slums all over Auckland and every property is able to be developed into a, a big slum? No. So the highest density, sorry, the highest density is just the terrace and terrace housing and apartment zone which is just 5% of Auckland. So essentially properties which are near terminals, big shopping complexes, bus stations, those are the areas that have been designated as high density zone. The rules are the most lenient. And then you come down from there into the urban zone, the suburban zone, which is the bulk, about 40 plus percentage. Then you've got single zone and the other zones that. So we normally focus on the top three for property development. So if you're looking at any particular property from now on to buy, it's good to check what zone it's under and what are the potential, uh, what is the likely potential to develop them. 
Unitary plan, so what's in it for me? Yes, that's, that's something we need to discuss. But before that, just thought I'll share with you three quotes. 90% of all millionaires become so through owning real estate. That's all over the world, not just New Zealand. Another one from Franklin Roosevelt. Real estate cannot be lost or stolen, nor can it be carried away, purchased with common death sense, paid for in full, and managed with reasonable care. It's about the safest investment in the world. That's why we are talking about it. That's from Robert Kiyosaki. Some of you know him. Real estate investing, even on a very small scale, remains a tried and true means of building an individual's cash flow and wealth. So why are we so passionate about it? Well, our, why we do things is this. This is what drives us. And what's a driver? We believe in challenging the status quo. Just because something is going in a particular way doesn't mean we just accept it and move on. We try to question that. Is this the best solution? Is this the best way to address this problem? So we challenge that and we give you total control of every part of your life through our design process. And I'll explain that in a bit more in detail. So just to give you a bit of a gist on that, we redevelop properties and, and help you achieve financial independence. As an example, this is a property in Kelston, old house, maybe 1950s, 60s, really a bit run down. So the proposal is to remove and rebuild. With what? With this. Now it might not be everybody's cup of tea, for, but for a property investor who's, who's bought this, and he might be just topping up a little bit to, uh, to maintain this and hope for capital growth, having this could potentially put him in the financial freedom path. One versus six. So I'll just talk about two examples that we've done of the projects that we've completed so far. This is a project in Newland. Again, rundown old house. So it had the main house there with a little garage. As we can see, very odd shaped site. And what did we do there? We proposed six units. Three level, roughly about 160 to 170 square meters each with single garage. And that's what it's looking like. You've seen the first photograph, that's what it looks like now. I'll just run you a little video to, see, to show you what we've done. Explain from. <coughs> so that's the existing house there. Those are four units in the front, and then two behind. <coughs> Six freehold titles. The 
so the ones behind, two units behind, back to back. And that's the shot from the rear side of the section. <coughs> Obviously, we haven't drawn the existing structures at the side. But this will give you an overview. So that's what it was before. That's what it's become, or it's going to become. So it gives you an idea, what's the potential? So it was one single section, one house, and suddenly it's converted itself to six units with six freehold titles. So you buy one property, and with a, with a little bit of proper planning, you can actually convert it into six different properties within one section, which you couldn't do three years back, but that's a possibility today. Uh, this is another one that we did in Mount Roskill, very similar, existing section with one house, real old brick and tile, corner section which was an advantage, definitely, and we divided that into four, that's existing, that's proposed, and hopefully, is the sound down? Put the sound a little bit. So that's our mantra. Make your section generate more income for you and move you towards financial independence. And we try to make the process easy for you. So at the end of the day, what do we do? We provide architectural design solutions to make your property work harder for you. 
So essentially looking at the unitary plan opportunities to get into infill housing. So if there's an existing house, we add one or two as we can, adjust the existing, or we remove and rebuild into how many units are possible. Uh, new houses, that includes new subdivisions, multi-unit dwellings, essentially terrace housing. We also do alteration and additions. So sometimes a property might have an existing house on, the, on it with a subfloor that's not really used and we can quickly do some design interventions to the lower level and from one house we can make it into three houses within the same footprint. So that's another option that, that is always there. So obviously like with anything we need a team to achieve everything. The process is complex, there's so much more compliance, we need a full team to go ahead. So this is our internal team we have with our designers. And then the most important is our extended team. And I've highlighted the three important ones who are here with, uh, uh, with us today to talk about how they are an important component in the entire machinery to help it work smoothly and achieve the required results. So I'll just give an example of a project that we three, we all the four of us are working on, and it's a project in uh, Glen Eden, existing house. So that's the existing house, that's a minor unit, existing. So what we're doing is we added two units there, and we extended that to make it into a full-fledged unit. Minor unit, as you're aware, is just a two-bedroom, it's actually a one-bedroom unit. So that's what it looks like now from outside those two new units and uh, we have the speciality is we have a guarantee before we take on any job we only give you a proposal when we know it actually works and I'll, we have this team around us who help us give you the right decision so if you feel that a project is having problems and it cannot get your building consent we don't even go there in the unlikely chance that we take something on and you are not able to get a consent even after complying everything with council, we have a money back guarantee. Nothing to lose. Second, your project will be within the budget. We don't guarantee that, but again, we have systems in place like project managers and quantity surveyors at the very onset to give you an idea, well, this is what it's going to cost. If it doesn't fit your budget, quit or change. Third, you are always in control. You know who you're dealing with and who's doing what. And that's our process line, which is obviously not very clear at this point, but essentially it's a three-stage process. And the first, first stage is where a planner comes into the picture. As soon as we look at a property, we do some little due diligence. I get a lot of calls, pretty much a call a day. And we turn to the planners to give us a little bit of a nudge and say, well, is it workable, is it not? And so the first cog in the wheel is a planner and I would like to introduce Barry who's been working with us for a while he's from Kiwi Vision they are not only planners they are surveyors planners and civil engineers and if you have worked with them you would know it's become so complex that you go to a surveyor then you go to a planner then you go to a civil engineer and coordinating people is a big headache and it's not getting any better but these guys have got all of that under one roof. So we just tell them what we want, they give us their feedback, we work on it, they lodge the resource consent. Barry. Thank, thank you, Bobby. Um, I'll just grab that for you. I'll sit down. Our presentation up. Um, yeah, as Bobby said, it's not um, as easy as it used to be 20 years ago with the Resource Management Act coming in and then the new unitary plan. But the unitary plan has has uh, freed things up a little bit so it's made life easy we we look at sites now and we think to ourselves we can well that's a two unit site and by the end of it there's four units on it where we thought there was possibly only two units to be able to get on it so where some things happen and um we we think we've got it down the new unitary plan allows a lot more flexibility to properties and uh, allows you to do a lot more than what you think. So that's where we've got many layers the new unitary plan, which is about that one. No, 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 that one. Okay. Okay. So we we've been doing this for forty years. Uh, as, uh, as 
Bob Hickson. We've got a team of planners, um, surveyors, civil engineers, project managers to manage the entire process. It's a lengthy process. And as Bobby said, um, sometimes uh, it takes a lot longer than what you initially think it might do. So we've broken that down into 21 steps, which is, seems quite a lot, but that's pretty much what we have to go through now. So when we look at a property, um, people come to us with an inquiry, we check, check out the unitary plan. If required, we'll speak to council officers and, and make sure that um, where we're heading is in the right direction. Uh, confirm that if the zone allows for development and there's, uh, as Bobby said, there's you know, three or four areas you'll get now um, to determine that and the unitary plan has multiple layers in it. So there's a few other things you've got to look at as, a, as opposed to just the zoning. And uh, site area is a big one. It, that determines the amount of units you can get on. And we check the title for it. Your certificate of title for any limitations. So quite often people miss the fact that um, on your certificate of titles there might be some encumbrances on there which won't allow you to do a few things. So we've got to do that due diligence and process to go through and look at your certificate of title and then know what we're looking at. So we start with the unitary plan, which is your planning map, and that's where we, is the, is the first step. And your title, sometimes it has a whole lot of things down here in the encumbrances and we've got to check with these easements. Covenant. Covenants. Covenants have property. Like covenants or whatever. There's a little bit of a loose connection, but anyway, we'll get there in the end. Um, so, as this one's got down here, down here a land. So, some t sometimes that things don't seem to add up and make, make things work properly. That's where we've got to go to for starters. Second, second we look at the drainage. And one of the big things we've got to get rid of is um, your store water. A lot of properties are... Some technical adjustments. <coughs> okay. Um, storm water, yeah, that's one of the big ones we've got to get rid of. Wastewater, all the, generally every section's got a, a wastewater connection. Your problem is if it's um, elevation contours make it hard to get to the wastewater. Storm water, not all the properties in Auckland have got storm water availability, so that's one of the things we have to really check out and look at to start with and make sure we've got the availability to get storm water because council will want any new development to be all the storm water from the driveways, the house, um, to go into a, a, a system, an existing pipe system. So that's where we look at this part of the geo maps and the unitary plan. It has existing drainage. Your red is um, usually your wastewater. Your green uh, is your stormwater. And then it has other water reticulation. So we also then go to the aerial photography on the GIS um, and look at the position of the existing dwelling, any auxiliary, auxiliary buildings, and that gives us a general idea of whether we can do a development. You can, one of the things, if you want to get into the back part of the site, you've got to be able to get past the existing house. So, general, um, general position of the existing dwelling. If you want to retain it, a lot of people want to retain the existing dwelling put something additional on so then we have to meet the bulk and location requirements. Um, council has now gone up from 35% to 40% in a lot of situations in high density um, areas. You can even go up to 50%, 60% of dwelling space on the, on, the, on the site. So those things we have to check out. Then we look at our design people and they see what, what available space there is to build units and, they, and then they that's where we hand over to Bobby. They work out what they can fit on the site and uh, work out how many units you can get out of that if you can get one, two, three additional dwellings. Um, same sort of photo that Bobby showed you before. We'll have a look at that. Here yeah, you can virtually, you know you're going to be able to get in the back section if the house is going to be retained. So there's a driveway already past the house to the garage. So access is one of the requirements. There's only three metres you're allowed to have between the house and the boundary to get a driveway down generally for most of the uh, areas. 
So having that space to get down, if you've got to get past an existing house to get into the back and retain the existing house is, is essential. So we'll use, the, we'll use the aerial photographs to give us a rough idea, but then we have to go out and survey the dwelling and make sure there's that space there as well. Site slope contours, the um, degree of slope can be um, a potential problem. If it's over one in five gradient, then you have to get geotechnical uh, people in to determine foundations and the slope and make sure that all the foundations are done correctly and the slope of set, slopier sections mean you've got to have more detailed foundations, which adds a cost to the development. So the less, the more, <coughs> Uh, less gradient you can have on the land, the flatter the land, the easier it is to do some development. So, again, those those contours can be looked at on the GIS maps in the in the in, in the council website. Funding. Uh, then we, once we get to that stage, we'll send people to people that that do the money part of the job, and uh, they'll go and speak to them and work on their budget, where they can get development finance, um, and that's a possibility. So that helps get the funding to get the building done and, uh, and get, it, get it built. So first step generally, once we decide that the property is available, is getting a topographical survey at the site. That's fixing the existing building, all the drainage, all the services, um, road access. Quite often these days we, where we do a development, the council want to know that uh, the crossings, there's not too many vehicle crossings close together for access into properties, um, and those things can sometimes restrict what you can do on a property. So um, we do the topographical survey, and then we'll hand that over to the architect, and he'll start his design process and work out whether the house, the existing house may be <coughs> moving to get some more dwellings on, or rip it off, build a whole lot of new dwellings, and then they can come up with a, with a plan for that. Uh, and design boundaries, so we'll design boundaries, they'll design boundaries, we'll come and work out the, the actual uh, exact boundaries and what, what needs to be done. So that's our typical topographical survey, which is on the one that we had the aerial photograph of, which had the garage at the back, that's going to be ripped off, being able to get in to the plan and then the architect goes to work on, on what's there. Okay, uh, and the um, architects came up with two additional dwellings on that site. So retaining the existing house, the existing house had to be adjusted a little bit to get the correct site coverage. I don't know whether you saw on that, it had a, a bigger deck area out the front and that was classed as site coverage. So that was adjusted to allow the correct site coverage for a couple of additional dwellings to go on the back. So. Our plan is once the design's done and the topographic, we, everything's going to fit height to boundary, site areas. We then go to the process of getting the resource consent, which can be 30 or 40 pages long, to cover off all the, all the questions that council want with regard to every, everything that they look at. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite a, a lengthy process. When I first started this to do a subdivision, we put in a two page report. Now it's multiplied many, many times to do that. So that's part of the information that goes in. That's the start of a, an application, and then that carries on for another 30 to 40 pages. So once it gets to council, um, that's when we start to get work out how long it's gonna take. <laughs> they go through and do a check, and do an initial check, and they'll accept the, uh, accept the consent, and then the planners go to work. So. We try to cover every every single thing that we think that we can, but nine times out of ten, they'll come back and ask for a section 92, so they'll request more information and the resource cons consent stage. We've been doing it for 40 years, we think we've got it right, we know everything, but about 50% of the applications come back asking for more information. So it's supposed to only take 20 working days to process an application, probably on an average that'll once they come back and ask for a section 92, you can add another double, double or triple that time easy. By the time you get go back, get them the information you want, send it back to them, it drops out of the process that they're in, so they've got to get it back into the process, so, and they're understaffed, as are many other departments around the country. So, 
eventually we get a resource consent and it'll have 10 or 20 conditions. So we have to evaluate those conditions and then satisfy them. And that'll be new driveways, new drainage connections, um, where the services are going to go. So that's the decision when we come back. We get the resource consent and then that'll flow on and have a whole lot of, whole lot of conditions on the consent which have to be satisfied. <coughs> so engineering uh, approvals, building consents for private drainage, retaining walls, demolition of existing buildings. So it can be a big list of things that you have to do to then go through and get, get it to a stage where you can start building. Um, telephone power has to be connected. If we create a vacant site, they have to be taken into the boundary. As part of the building process, if there's new dwellings being designed, they'll be part of the deal. Quite often they have to be covered by easements. So getting easements and things over all the services, that's getting more complicated with um, chorus and vector and all those supplies of stuff. They want all sorts of easements engrossed over the property to supply your services. So whereas we used to put them in cover them by an easement that was just said power telephone water going in here. Now they want easements in gross and all sorts of things that give them carte blanche um, access to your property to do any whatever they want to do. So arranging the tender for the contract, tendering is the easiest and quickest way um, and we sometimes draw up those tenders and help the people find the contractors. We'll recommend contractors. The tenders come back, we evaluate those and <coughs> say who we're going to go with and meets the criteria. Generally with tenders, your, your um, contractors, they have a lead in time. So quite often, one, one contractor might be a lot cheaper, but he might be able to get to it for three months. So you might take a more expensive contractor who's available in a month's time. So that's part of the deal. So we set out the construction works, the drainage, the driveways, proposed dwellings, um, council wants certificates for all those sort of things now. So whereas once upon a time, Typical construction site excavation. We've marked out the dwelling to be on the corners. We put pegs in on the corners of the dwellings, and the builders will come in and put profiles up. And we would have set out the bulk excavation first off. Supervision. We've got engineers that supervise any of the engineering works because if you don't get that signed off by council, you have a big fight at the end when you go to get your completion certificate. So we have to get those inspections done right. Council will come in and do inspections from time to time. Uh, generally you have to arrange a pre-site meeting with the engineers to be able to get things. So driveways, you, you, your driveways are deeper than the standard driveway, so they, whereas your old house driveway used to only have to be 100 mil, these have got to be minimum 150 mil if you've got a common driveway for a development and you have to get all the drainage in the right place. They want all the stormwater taken away off the driveway to a pipe system, so that has to be done properly. <coughs> We come in and do anything that, that has to go into the public asset register, such as new public drainage, the council will take over assets. So then we have to do an as-built survey and do an asset register, work out the cost of it. Uh, it's quite a bit of paperwork. So it's not a, as it, the drain layers can do private drainage as-builts, but we have to submit these type of plans to council. This is a stormwater as-built, showing all the stormwater for a new six foot six lot subdivision, I think it was a seven lot subdivision. So they want to see all that and where all the drainage is going, which assets they're going to take over, and the private connections go into the boundary. That public, once they hit the boundary, they're public once they, everything up to the boundary is classed as uh, public drainage and then becomes private drainage once it hits the boundary. So we have to get all that signed off uh, for every subdivision. So. At the end of the documentation, you get a sign-off from council, a completion certificate, which then allows us to lodge a, a, a CSD. Then we can go and finish <coughs> pegging all the boundaries, putting in boundary marks that identify where your legal boundaries are. So there's a little there's a little aluminium disc in there that goes into concrete, as opposed to a peg that was on the previous one. We then lodge a cadastral data set with Land Information New Zealand, which then um, from that titles can be can be created. The final piece of information from council is a 223 and a 224 certificate and they have to be, you have to get them from council for you to get titles. So then your solicitor gets involved uh, with us, we give them a whole lot of information, they then apply for new titles. Your new titles should issue within 10 days of the plan being approved, that land information. 
you've got your new tots, but you knew it's land. Now you can go and with your new asset, free up cash, reduce your mortgage, build a new home, go on a world cruise because you've made some money out of property. So that's the process. It's not, not quick and easy, but uh, it's doable and there's a lot of people out there doing it, so you just got to work your way through it. Thank you. A couple of finished products. The house is just about finished, ready for new titles. Thank you. Thank you, baby. Sounds real easy, right? <laughs> I can see the halo behind your back. Wow, I know about subdivision, I know about planning, and I, I know it all, and where the drainage is, and where the bloody storm water is going. These are the things we have to deal with on a day to day basis. And what we try to do is keep the client or owner as insulated as possible from the ground realities and problems. But there's one important person here, along with the planner, that needs to come in pretty soon. Any guesses? After the planner, you've, you've got the design, you've got some planning checks, and it looks like the project is feasible. What's the next thing that drives it? The builder. The builder. You need to know the cost, right? You need to, you need to you can borrow that money from the bank. So you need a project manager who can give you an indication of some cost, makes you understand where it's all heading towards and whether it's even feasible from a construction perspective as well. So that's where we have KMB Construction coming into the picture. He's a project manager and builder and gets involved pretty much from the concept design stage, which is usually not the case in a typical uh, project like this. So we'd like to welcome Bhupendra yeah. Kumar, yeah. KMB Construction. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah. I will try to use this, hopefully it works. I do it. Okay. <laughs> So basically, we are a project management as well as builder company. We have been doing it for the last 11 years. And we have a team of engineers who help us in doing all the construction work. Plus we deal with, sorry, this, I will go by this. So <clears throat> I'm a chartered professional engineer as well as a master builder. Plus we have a team of engineers and project managers. And we do all the subdivision and construction work all around Auckland. Right, from Pukikoi to North Shore and Ranvi. We believe in your building house, dream house. And the choice is yours, not what the other people say. As subject to restriction from council, obviously. But we believe in superior quality and customers are obviously our best assets. Okay, now everybody wants to earn extra money. You know, and this is one way of property enhancement we can achieve. Either we can sell the extra property we built, or rent it out, or move into a new one. There are so many options available, and this is where we come into the picture to help you. <clears throat> okay, we start. We get involved in the projects from the very beginning. As soon as the concept design is done, we review it to see whether this, there is enough space utilization, what is the budget of the project. So that, you know, because no point uh, planning for something like six houses or eight houses, if, if you, it's going out of the budget. So, and also we check the constructability. Sometimes designs are such, it's not possible to, design, to construct on site. There are some, so many other limitations. So that's where we get involved and we try to maximize the value of your house or project. We deal with, we liaison with all the consultants from day one. Like, as soon as the concept design is done, we get involved with the uh, target design and consult, other consultants. There's a list of them which you are already given, so I will go quickly through that. And we also deal with infrastructure people. Okay. <clears throat> Once the building consent is done, like, you have seen the resource consent process. After that, Bobby takes over and does the building consent. We get involved in the construction process after that, and that involves like right from earthwork, footing, foundation, superstructure, roof, cladding. Cladding is the walls outside, which can be like weatherboard, jib, sorry, weatherboard, bricks, or cedar, or whatever you like. Jib fixing and stopping, waterproofing and tiling, paint, waterproofing, decking, kitchen, bathroom, glass wall, straight finishing, and landscaping. 
So there's a long process and at every stage we not only we check everything because we are engineers, there's a council inspection involved at every stage. So there are about 11 inspections at footing, foundation, frame, cavity wrap, cladding, pre-line. Pre-line means jib, basically. Before we do the jib, council comes again and check everything. Post line, decking and drainage. So what it ensures is that there are not only one eye, there are three or four different eyes who have checked your building to make sure that it's perfect for, you know, it's perfect construction. Okay, subdivision process is already explained by Ari, but I will just go through it. Lies, in, we, lies with all the consultants like architect, engineers, which includes structural, geotech, civil, surveyor, Auckland Council, and then infrastructure people like water care, vector, vector for power, chorus for telephone, Auckland transport, and sometimes Auckland parks if you have to get permission from them. Then in the end, we, through surveyor, we apply for 2 to 3 and 2 to 4 which is the end of the subdivision process already explained. <clears throat> we will just quickly show you some of the projects we have done. This is a single story house in Karaka. But, and there is an overhead line you can see, so the height was limited. And we have made it to way so that it looks quite, you know, like a double story house, but actually it's a single story house. This is a double story house we did with uh, subdivision in Mount Roskill, and the site was quite sloping. This is just a single story house in, on a new subdivision. This is replaced a old house in Hillsboro with a new one. The old house was like about to be demolished. That one is in Glenville. I will just show you the picture of a new house we built in Mount Roskill. This is the house you look during the day, but we put extra lights in the soffit. So during night time it looks like this. So you can add those things. <clears throat> and the, on this house you can see this is a leather board and this is a schist column. But if you want we can provide schist on the surface also. So you can see this is a house built with brick and leather board. Yeah, this is a proper tray. With kitchen, you can have so many different ideas and you can spend as much as you like, but we try to have a nice kitchen, like still engineered stone or granite with the... Okay, now you can see different types of kitchen we have done based on the budget, but we, we ensure that your money is spent wisely. This is splashback, like the client shows that color, so... And this is all engineering stone. I mean, we don't design it, but we help the architects uh, to meet the client's requirement. There's uh, some bathrooms like full height tiles. With, you can see that spa here. This one is a double vanity, and I'm not sure the pictures are clear there or not, but yeah. <coughs> then was in Mount Wellington. Okay, so if you have any questions, we can answer at the end. But we can basically we can make things to suit you, whatever you want, and we deal with you like throughout the process about the costing. So if your cost is going over the budget, then we can cut down some items, and then we advise the architect to do that. So this is the way. And if you got extra money for property developers, we do it differently. We try to maximize their profit, so that still people get a nice house, but. There's no point of like doing full height tiles if developer is wanting to reduce the cost. So those, we look for economies in design and construction. Okay. I think I have covered most of it and back to Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. So we identified the property, we went to the designer, we went to the planner, we went to a property, uh, sorry, a manager and now we need the funding we need the money so we go to somebody like we have got somebody here from who's, who's eager to give away loans just tick 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 <laughs> loan market so they are uh, maybe just a few minutes about how loan market could help you finance your property property development and then don't forget 
once you get the money and you build it, there's a few, there's another important aspect that I will come to. You want to sell it. You're a property investor. You're not there to live. You're here to sell. And so you need good people to sell them. And we've got Christopher here. He's from Ray White and his team. And uh, Ash as well, who are here to just sell your properties. They just love selling properties. But please build them properly. And, and something that's viable and sustainable. <coughs> so we'll hear a quick, perhaps a minute from him. We are running a bit late. And then we'll go on to another cog in the wheel, which is Richards. Right, so the funding side of things, I don't need the microphone because I'm told I'm loud enough. Excellent. The funding side of things, you've got to really look at to start with. Um, you know, for, for most people, they need that money early on to start the process of subdividing or getting the building. So the key with us is that we develop a financial plan. We teach you whether you can use the equity in your current properties that you own to actually start the process. It may be just the simple subdivision side of things, then producing to the to the um, building side. But what you've got to realise is that we, in, within loan market, we have access to not only the main banks, but all the second tier lenders that maybe some of you don't necessarily have access to. So what we endeavour to do is give you all an opportunity to get a financial plan to start with, and then help you through the process of getting the money so that you can do this. And there's a, a number of ways to do it. So, you know, we are always available to talk through the process first, have a meeting, decide whether you actually are able to get the funding and then implement that funding plan for you so that you can achieve it. And at the end of the day, it's not we can't do it, it's how do we do it and how do we implement the plan to do it. So Tracy and myself are around afterwards. If you want to have a chat about these sorts of things, you know, feel free. We work with the agents and property managers. So we actually all work as a bit of a team. Um, so you know, we can give you some really good ideas to how to get that final financial independence that gets you to develop your property and own your own home. And in the end, the whole thing is to have a passive income or have no mortgage at all. So that's our job. Thank you very much, man. So now all your finances are sorted. Go to, go to bed peacefully. Right, next we have uh, Richards Consulting. Now, to my knowledge, structural engineers are not really in the forefront, but they are very important in the background. Because without a structural engineer, you can't get a property completed. Is that right? But also what people don't realize, and that's why uh, Richards are here, is that they can play a very important part in making the project or the structure, the design, very economical to build, which KMB Construction will acknowledge and agree with me. So can we call upon uh, Sam from uh, Richards Consulting, who's our preferred uh, structural engineers for our projects. Sam. Uh, so we've got a team of chartered engineers. We've been going nationally for about 10 years. Uh, and Nick Baker here uh, manages our Auckland office. Um, you want to move this? Yeah. 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 Uh, so first of all, just seeing you running short of time, we'll probably, I'll briefly just talk about structural engineering and what we do, and then Nick will come up uh, soon and just talk about uh, the process and the value we can add to these uh, residential multi-unit uh, Next one up. Next one up. Next one up. Yeah. 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 So firstly, what is a structure? The structure is like our skeleton. It's here to resist the wind, the earthquake, probably not much snow up here, um, and people crowding loads and, and vehicle loads as such. Um, what's the purpose of what we do? Uh, our main aim is to safeguard life and uh, property. So just because it's more of interesting, uh, this is what you don't want to happen. This is a high profile case down in Dunedin, uh, debt collapsed, causing uh, rather substantial injuries and, and life changing injuries. So we don't want that kind of thing happening. So our primary job is, is to do that, to make sure it doesn't happen. So uh, here's a more interesting photo. You can see the house on the left. This is down in Christchurch, three stories. That's what happened after the earthquake, it became two stories. Um, that, that's due to the poor uh, design of the, the lateral loads of the ground floor. So it's effectively pancaked and gone down. Um, the reason I'm adding that, apart from the reasonably gory photo, is there's an underperceived risk of earthquake in Auckland. Um, although, you know, the, the probabilities of earthquake in Auckland are low, but in the 1800s there was two sizable earthquakes recorded that were in the vicinity of Christchurch. So it's still something, although it's low, we need to make sure the design point doesn't happen to your future investments. 
Um, secondly, we've got to make sure safeguard from loss of amenity. That means your floors can't bounce, you don't want floors vibrating around, you don't want the house to move around the wind. There's even perception in a big wind event that things moving around, uh, everyone feels unsafe. So we've got to make sure it's functional and everyone can walk around and use the house happily. Um, the third thing we've got to make sure is that the building's going to last. So the building that requires, uh, they're going to last at least 50 years, uh, but that's minimum. Uh, and a lot of you are putting a lot of you know, large money into the house, so you don't really want to have zero value in the house at the end of 50 years. Um, so with a little bit more attention to detailing by the builder, the architect, uh, and us, we can make sure the house is going to last a lot longer than that, so you've got it, um, it doesn't depreciate as fast as what, what you expect it to. Um, in Auckland, you've got a few special issues. Um, one is the expense of clays, uh, and that influences our foundations. Um, so our clays are shrinking, they're uh, swelling, and they're causing all types of stresses in our foundations. So a key part of what we do in Auckland is designing foundations. Uh, the other thing in Auckland is you've got a very rolling topography. Um, so combined with the expense of clays, uh, you end up with on the, um, the slope of the hill, you end up with lateral movements, uh, and a good portion of the stock of houses in the Auckland uh, have suffered a bit of that lateral movement and sinking on, on the downhill side. Uh, so obviously part of our design is to make sure that that doesn't happen so you don't have future maintenance or repair work. Uh, the other thing is in Auckland, the services everywhere. For some reason, Barry and the team, you make public services throughout all the properties. Uh, and part of our design is we've got to make sure foundations span over those services. So when, if you imagine if they're crisscrossing, <coughs> we haven't got much ground left to support our foundations on. Um, so that's part of what we do. Um, so that's very brief, and now Nick can talk about the process of the <coughs> Cool, so I'm going to have a quick chat to you about how we add value and our process. Um, so we're generally involved in the design process at the early stages. Uh, so Bobby may come to us with a project before resource consent stage and we'll help them with um, trying to get the building under high correlation boundary issues by uh, designing uh, sorry, um, shallower depth joists or um, also give you a concept structural scheme to take your QS to get your pricing and your line. Um, we look to optimise the structural layout, um, some minor tweaks of the floor plan by uh, moving a wall slightly or increasing the length in the wall can um, get rid of a whole beam and um, that adds up if you're doing six units all the same. Um, we look to reduce material and, uh, volume and cost so our number one um, option is timber, it's a more sustainable option and um, if we can't get timber to work we'll use the lightest weight steel beam because the money in the steel is in the weight. Um, so we also think about the project uh, from the onset as a whole through to construction. So we'll look at um, issues, site issues on site like um, access, whether you need Walls to be built first, and we'll discuss that with the guys at KMB um, and Bobby. Uh, we obviously work to meet your budget and your program. Uh, we're involved at the later stages, and you've been through quite a process <coughs> now, so we appreciate that you want to get it through and done as quick as possible. So that's what we aim to do. And um, yeah, we minimise council RFI queries and respond promptly at that point. Um, just a very quick example for you, uh, the Rosia Road project which Bobby touched on lightly. Um, <coughs> this is a, uh, it's not too clear but um, down the bottom here, say this window was slightly wider, um, we would come back to Bobby and say look, with the window being so big you need a steel frame across here and um, that can be generally costly and uh, you don't want to see as much steel as, um, what well, you want to try to see as least steel as possible. So we'll come back with options, say, if you increase the wall or decrease the window outlook by 100 mil or so, we can get a tim frame bracing element in there and reduce the, um, reduce the uh, cost of the steel involved. So that kind of options we look at. And um, just a simple floor plan of the same house. Um, this is the floor joist framing plan. So we had a couple overhanging areas here, or cantilevers, and a larger um, overhang here. Um, so in this area we aim to uh, optimise the joist, timber joist that we already had for the floor and um, to reduce the need for steel and then we got away with just having two steel beams in this floor plan which is um, all good. So our approach, uh, we are client focused, 
um, we provide advice right from the start. So like I was saying about the QS and um, uh, help with resource consent issues and getting around that. Um, we listen to uh, your needs and then provide options for consideration. Um, so I mean, you won't get a design which is hard and fast, this is what you've got to deal with it. It's more of an iterative process and we understand you've got the particular needs you want, so we'll come back to you with options at that concept design stage. Um, we have a real focus on the practical side uh, to ensure the process and build as efficient as possible. So we're working with your builders and um, your team on site before they get there and while on site. Um, and then uh, most importantly ensuring what we design is actually buildable. Um, we're communicative and responsive and uh, we have a very open communication line with Bobby and his team and the other consultants involved in the job and um, rounding it out um, where we take a team kind of collaborative approach because um, it can't all be done by one person and um, it works better if we're all working together. So yeah, that's me. Thanks. Thanks, Simon, Nick. That was great. So, I mean, you just touched upon obviously a few things that are very instrumental in keeping the cost down. And it's very important that we listen and talk to each other and save our clients lots of money. So, these were the three important parts. There are more consultants. Obviously, we can't have all of them in one room in a limited amount of time. But these are the key components we felt that have been influencing uh, us in our design and ultimately affecting the cost of the project. So I'll just wrap that up. So we try to get you from start to finish in terms of these consultants. You see those. So that's where Kiwi Vision come into place. The second place is where the project manager comes in place very early in the piece. And somewhere here is where structural engineers have a place. There are other consultants as well. So basically, there are three important areas which I just wanted to conclude with. First is the site selection in terms of any property that you're looking at buying from now on. And we're quite happy to for you to send us an email. Don't, don't send us 10 properties on one day. I'm looking at the Barfoot Thompson and I've got 20 properties. Bobby, can you tell me? Sorry. But if you send me one off, uh, you know, once a while, uh, one, once a week, once even once a day perhaps, you know, tell me beforehand. I can at least do some due diligence to whatever we are, possible, we are able to, and I can let you know. Second is a team selection. Obviously, we've got that in place, and that's why we're able to give you a lot more information in a very short time. And basically, understanding the whole development process. Every site comes with its own set of challenges, and the better we identify it earlier on, the better it is for you. So at the end of the day, it's all about teamwork. Team, together everyone achieves more, that includes yourself. That's exactly what we do. You know what? Most of the people, they'll go there, dig, 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 and they'll come back. But because we've got a team, we actually dig, 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 and actually get there, and that's where the diamond is. So what do we do? We are diamond diggers. We dig for diamonds in your property. Pull them out. Polish them. And hand them back to you as a gift. How about that? That's our job. And we get, we take pride in polishing the diamond and giving it back to you. So we are diamond diggers. You find diamonds that you didn't know existed. As I said, take, polish, and hand back back to you. And I'll just leave you with an example of how we do that. I'm not just saying this. We actually do it. An example. We got called to a place. Glen Eden house, 600 square meters. A house, the section is like this, the house is like this. You know, you've seen those houses, complete at a skew. He wanted to add a double garage and a master bedroom on top. And we don't know where to add because so many problems. It was a 40 year old, 48 year old house. It had pretty much come to the end of its life. And we nodded our heads, I was there with the builder. I said, yeah, it's possible. So <coughs> he had a 600 square meter section, three bedroom house, 45 plus years old, house not well maintained, end of its cycle, Section perhaps costed him about 400,000 a few years back. Rents for 500 a week. <clears throat> Just covers costs, but nothing in his pocket. And then I heard him on and said, can I suggest you something? And you can just throw it away if you don't like it. <coughs> so he suggested this. 
existing house with an addition. I suggested, why don't we remove the house and put one, two, three houses there. And then he said, oh, but what a more. They didn't know about loan market at that point. Anyway, so I told them, yes, you're borrowing, say, 350 to 400,000 to do the addition that you don't like in a house that you just about are living, but you don't love it. And you want to have an extra mortgage for the rest of your 10 or 20 years, whatever you want. <coughs> if you build three houses, about, say, 150 square meters each, construction cost about $2,000 a square meter, roughly, give or take. So just if you if you do the numbers, 450 square meters for three houses, right? Multiply by two, 900,000. Yeah, right? So there's other costs, initial costs of that, add another, say, 300,000, <coughs> 1.2 million. Does that sound right, property investors? I'm not a property investor myself, like you guys, but 1.2 million, you need to borrow for to build three houses. I told them, why don't you sell two houses? What do you think one house will sell for in Glen Eden? Christopher? 700? 700? Yeah. Conservative? Today's market? Depressed market? 700, two houses. How much that is? 1.4. Right? What about the third house? He's got a mortgage free third house that he moves in as soon as it is finished. And he's got $200,000 in his pocket. Now, is that a bad idea? <coughs> That's what I call it that. So you need to engage with that process earlier on and not talk to one person. One person can't do anything. It's all about the team. So here we are as a team to answer any questions that you might have. Can I call upon Barry, Fendra, and Sam to come on stage? Whatever we can stay here for. And any questions that you might have got in terms of any gen generic ones, if there's anything specific, don't forget to uh, write down on your feedback form, and one of us will contact you. Yes? When you're looking at a site, how important is the shape of the section, the width of the section, and whether it's a blue lagoon on the council website or not? How much flooding? Can we build on a section that does have that lovely blue overlay? Yeah. Thank you. You'll have to get a um, you'll have to get a, an assessment done for to set a floor level uh, if the, if it's in a flood zone. So it's a matter of getting a, um, a stormwater engineer in uh, to do an assessment, and quite often they'll come up. Sometimes council has them already on site, but generally they require a report, and then they'll set a floor level above the 100, 100 year flood zone. So you can still build in flood prone areas, but um, you have to spend a bit more money getting. Report stuff. The shape, how important are the shapes, the sections that we buy? Yeah. Notice one of those sections wasn't a nice rectangle, it was quite angular. Yeah, the more rectangular they are, the easier they are to work with because then you, you've got set boundaries. But we built some, our office is on a quite a wedge shaped site, so it was a matter of getting the design done. We, we engaged architects, good arch we, we engaged two architects for a concept. And I had a picture in my mind of what I wanted. One of the architects came up with a design that just blew us away, and we built built the offices, which was built around a, a pyramid shape rather than I, I envisaged a, a right angle building. So the architects come in and give us the give us the incentive or the um, ideas, and just blew us out of this. So sections that are odd shapes still can be built on. They're just a bit more of a challenge for the architects to come up with. The, and how far away, well, when you look at the stormwater and wastewater, like sometimes the stormwater can be 10 metres, 20 metres or 60 metres away. Mm. At what point is, is it not feasible, cost-wise, to get the stormwater or wastewater onto the site? Yeah. Each, each uh, site is individual. Probably 80 metres, okay. uh, you're starting to get into fairly high sort of cost. But I wouldn't want to go any more than 80 metres with your stormwater. But up to 80 metres, you can... But then you quite often you've got to get permission of property owners if it's out on the road. But, yeah. So do you access the stormwater and water from other people's properties or just from the public, like on the road? Sorry? Do you access stormwater and wastewater from other people's properties or do you do it from the public services on the road? 
uh, if it's not on site, you have to go through other people's properties or out to the road. Council, in some situations, will let you take it out to the channel, uh, in the road channel, if you can get the fall and the rights of the drainage out there. But uh, if, it's, if it's through the property, it's a lot easier, but there's not many of those left these days. They're getting harder to find. A quick one, the last example in Glenida, where you know, if the owner has agreed to have you know, three dwellings over there, post um, building, pro, um, building consent, say that's approved at some point in time, how long do you allocate to build, like complete those three properties in general? On an average, from the time you start the project to the time you can keep it ready for selling, is anywhere between 18 months to 24 months, so two years. Depends on the complexity. If it's a relatively simple project, perhaps one and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, uh, I normally tell clients budget for two years. It takes that much time. Right. Uh, if you're doing development on a busy road, does it affect the construction cost, mm -hmm. like vehicle management and all this thing? On a very busy road, you are know, making four dwellings. Does it impact the pricing or you know, construction or impact the time frame? Yeah. Uh, not that much. I mean, we still have to do the traffic management when we do the vehicle crossing outside. I mean, obviously we can't park the truck on the road. That's not a, a lot of difference. If like services are available, like there's a traffic light there, services are very close to that. So yeah. is it a problem there to even manage that? Or? I think uh, the new vehicle crossing is not allowed near the road crossing. I mean, like, there's some distance which where you can be more. But obviously on a very busy road, we find it hard to do services uh, along the road because in the uh, footpath section or the road is off, there will be big electrical power, sorry, water, gas lines. And so it gets a bit more expensive from that point of view, not from construction point of view. We employ a traffic engineer to get yeah. it done. Yes. How does the gradient affect in the crossing? In the slope of the land? Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. First thing is gradient, right? You have to check whether it's buildable or not, because it's going against. Suppose your services are on the road side, and your section is sloping down, you won't be able to connect it. I mean, it gets more expensive from that point of view. But from building point of view. When it's sloping down, the house has, still has to be flat. So there are two options. Either we cut the site to the lower level, or we build on the higher level. In both cases, it's more than the flat section. As a thumb rule, I can give you some like, it's not, like for a normal house, like a double story house, it will cost you around $25,000 more per meter of slope. Just a rough, very rough guide. Because people think that it is the same cost, now you have to do retaining wall, or block wall, or cut and do retaining wall. So we work out the best possible option for that. Yes, John. Our property is four different parties, so is, does one of you take the lead in managing the, 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 the process from beginning to end? Yeah, we just try, try and fight with each other and say, I'm the leader. <laughs> <laughs> People are so tired, they didn't even do it. <laughs> but is it, is it a, um, a, one, a one sort of stop solution, or do you sort of introduce the, the device from you to... It's a single uh, source, actually. You yeah. start off with the architect, and he drives it from there on to see who is going to be taking what uh, areas. So they all, yeah, Bobby. so it'll be, you'll be, your source will be starting from Bobby. Usually people come to us with the initial queries even before they even bought the section. So from that time, we can support them. And then as and in the process, whoever is required, we pull them in and get them to do their bits. And take so it from your site assessment, you can say, so yeah. like how we said before, you've seen a place and you want to know if it's viability <coughs> and all that, you start with the problem. All right, any other questions? All those are all good? Yes? That uh, six dwelling you built, yes. what was the answer? What was it, sorry? The land size, the land. The land size, it was about uh, just under 900, 895, 896. And uh, four dwellings? 
the four dollar one. Four dollar was about I think it was a space similar. Eight fifty. Eight fifty. Yeah. Eight. He's the one who's worked on it, so he's more aware. <laughs> That's eight fifty three square meters. Um, yeah. The last example we have Section of 650. Correct. So according to you, think, um, you need at least 300 square meters per. <coughs> no, it's that is. So it's cross keys or common wall or something like that. Okay. See, there are two rules. One is if there's a vacant lot subdivision for which you need minimum <coughs> areas, but those days are history. If you're going for vacant land subdivisions, you're never going to get the proper yield from your property. So what we do is we say which section it is, which zone it's under, suburban <coughs> or urban. And then we design houses and see how much we can fit in by complying with all the planning rules. So on a 600, you could fit easily three, you can even, even push it to four. As long as you comply, you can even do six, but we know that's not a possibility. So there's no minimum areas in terms of construction or, or planning perspective. It's about how much you can fit, how big the houses are. And you have to remember one thing, all sections we're getting now uh, you know how you you buy pieces of cloth, like you, know, you go to a cloth shop and you buy two meters, ten meters, six meters, and then you've got those those last leftovers. You know they put it put in that bin, and then you say, how much is there? I want five meters. Sorry, it was one and a half. Want it? Take it or leave it. Sorry to say, but auction, I mean currently in Auckland, that's the situation. You get sections that are leftovers and, and spillovers. But we got to take that as an opportunity rather than saying, oh my god, it's not in a good shape, it's not got storm water, it's not got this. If we sit and do that, we're not going anyway. And that's where I think it's more challenging for us. And we like excitement. Don't we? Yes. Of course. All right. So thank you very much for coming. Arun would like to perhaps just conclude and thank Yeah, we've got a lucky draw for uh, 38 million, which I think one of these guys are going to announce. So you can collect your million dollars and uh, yeah. Also, your feedback, please. Um, if you can hand over your feedback for the seminar which we had to Santosh and uh, Koma, and drinks and nibbles are here still, please. You can sort of interact with each other, get to know. Any other questions, you can ask them. So before you get up, just ensure all your visiting cards are in the box. There's, there's a few dollars uh, in the gift box. The uh, rest, Armand is going to pay in terms of minus 38 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after I build a few unitary plans here. <laughs> so just ensure everybody's got their visiting cards. And uh, should we get somebody from here to just pick one? And that's a good time of waiting for you. Uh, just let. let uh, yeah, so Barry didn't get the whole thing. Let, 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 <laughs> yeah, let, let Barry do it. All right. <laughs> there you go. That is Grand Why is he supposed to give, not take? Grand is supposed to give, not take. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I know it, you uh, were all brave because the weather this morning wasn't looking too good. So my wife was looking at the Met report every hour and hoping and praying that people turn up. So thank you for coming. And I hope you've taken something with you today to start thinking on before you invest the uh, next property. So and you know what you're going to call. That's important. Yes, yeah, so we are the Ghostbusters. diamond diggers in your property, oh, okay. <laughs> in the property that you're going to buy. So please return the feedback forms, and if there's anything specific you want us to look at uh, straight away about a property you are intending to buy or you've just bought, uh, feel free to give us a call, or, or just write that in the form and we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Have some drinks and nibbles before you leave. Network, meet each other, and ensure you drive back home. <coughs>